These homes could be in your town. This school could be down your street. And these kids could be your neighbors. But these homes and schools and families are at ground zero in Chicago's fight against violent crime. Inside the front lines. Chicago has a national reputation for violent crime, but most of that crime is concentrated in small and isolated areas of the city, making it all too easy for others here to dismiss it as happening somewhere else to someone else. I'm Rob Stafford. In this special report, NBC5 Investigates takes you inside these dangerous neighborhoods to uncover the enormous challenges for the people who must live here. We'll also give you an exclusive look at some new high-tech methods used by the police who fight the crime here. And we investigate the problems that persist here. We begin with a family whose kids want to ride their bikes and play at the park just like anyone else, but who live in a community where kids can no longer be kids. Here's Tammy Leiter. The sun is not even up, and Corey and Stacy Ellis already have their kids on the move. Their six-year-old Miles, 11-year-old Marshall, and Marcel, a high school freshman. Yeah. Corey and Stacy both work full-time, yet they have another full-time job, carefully scripting nearly every moment of their kids' days, like a well-orchestrated symphony. They play basketball, baseball, football. Everything's structured because they can't do the simple things that most kids and parents take for granted. I wish they could walk to the store. I wish they could walk to White Castles. I wish you could walk to school. It would be nice. It would be nice, but Corey and Stacy Ellis go to great lengths to keep their boys from doing those things because they live here in Chicago's Roseland neighborhood on the south side. It's ground zero in a virtual war zone of crime that no child should have to navigate. NBC5 Investigates took some of the basic kid things most families take for granted playing outside, getting fast food, walking to school, and then dug through Chicago's crime reports to see what they would be like for Marcel, Marshall, and Miles. We found that within a block of the Ellis' home, there have been dozens of violent crimes in the past year, including 12 with guns, 36 incidents of assault and battery, and 10 armed robberies. There were also four arrests for crack and heroin and three for sex crimes, all within this one block in one year. Up the street, it's no better. Yeah, taking a chance coming over here. Yeah, even just to get a sandwich, you're taking just a chance? A sandwich, yeah. This hoagie shop is along the route Marcel would take if he were allowed to walk to school. Would it surprise you to know that there was an armed robbery in this neighborhood? No. How about that people were arrested with guns? In fact, NBC5 Investigates found 26 armed robberies and more than 200 incidents of assault and battery out of more than 300 violent crimes in the past year, just along Marcel's route to school. Think about that. A violent crime for nearly every day of the year on your child's route to school. I don't know if what happens in impoverished communities is fully understood by the masses. Activist Stephen Gates describes these neighborhoods as having invisible boundaries that kids can't cross, whether it's from violence, drugs, or gangs. For me, it has a third world country feel, and I've had other people uh, second that, that, they, that it felt like these kids were living in a wartime or a third world country. But it's simply a way of life for many Chicago area kids, where even the neighborhood playground is off limits. In fact, it was a neighborhood park where one of Marcel's friends and teammates was gunned down. He wasn't the intended target. You know, it really didn't hit him at first, but we were just driving one day and he just was looking out the window and he just started crying. But Miles, Marshall and Marcel don't want your pity. They simply want to be kids. I kind of wish I could kind of hang out with not, with, without my parents worrying about my safety. Stacy and Corey Ellis are saving up to buy a home and move out to a safer neighborhood, away from the front lines. But those lines can also keep people inside these poor and dangerous neighborhoods, simply because there's nowhere else to go. NBC5 Investigates found that's often the case for the tens of thousands of inmates released each year from Illinois prisons. Here's Carol Marine. 
Chicago, we talk about it being separated by gangs, right? But no, it's separated by zip codes. So which zip codes did ex-offenders land in last year? The largest group, 1,570, went to zip code 60608, which includes parts of Bridgeport and Pilsen. This map shows the highest concentrations of inmates released last year, from 60628 on the far south side to a corridor along the Eisenhower Expressway running from Lawndale to Austin, where hundreds of ex-offenders returned to the pockets of poverty they left. This is the Austin neighborhood, zip code 60651, where last year 616 released inmates came to live. We've come here to talk to eight recently released men whose crimes range from burglary to retail theft to DUI. Eight men with one story about finding a job. Do people ask if you're an ex-offender? Yes, they do. And what happens then? Well, um, I never get a call. Joseph Summers got an interview at a subway. I try to tell him, you know, you know, I don't get a lot of second chances, so I'm going to try harder, harder than maybe the guy that never been in trouble. But no and job. Just... It's the box that often beats them. Check off, yes or no, have you ever been convicted of a crime? Once you check that box, you would be guaranteed that your application would be in the trash and you will not get a call. Though that is changing now. State Representative LaShawn Ford successfully fought to have the box removed from initial applications for state jobs. And a law will soon go into effect in Illinois banning the box in most private businesses. It was a narcotics charge that sent Mark Mitchell to prison decades ago. Now he has four college degrees. And you can't find a full-time job? No, ma'am. But you've been out for 20 years. Doesn't mean anything. Even though I've been home 30 years, if I go seek employment, I still got to check the box. If an employer can actually tell any one of those people, I don't hire uh, people with criminal records, I find that to be very discriminatory. At this Safer Foundation Center, 385 IDOC inmates are being taught skills in order to find employment and increase their education. 38% of Illinois inmates tested last year by the Department of Corrections had math and reading skills below a sixth grade level. Here in Illinois, the state offers tax incentives for hiring ex-offenders, and the city is increasing its second chance initiative, and the CTA has an ex-offenders apprentice program. And in the Chicago Lawn neighborhood, as the Chicago Reporter notes, a marching band trumpeted the opening of a rehabbed house where ex-offenders will live and try to find work, even as the stigma of incarceration remains. Why wouldn't you give a person a chance who has changed his life? I'm not that person any longer. When we come back, an exclusive look at the Chicago Police Department's new methods to combat the constant violence they face inside the front lines. We continue our examination inside Chicago's front lines by looking at the police who confront the violence here every day. NBC5 Investigates got exclusive access to some new state-of-the-art methods, which police hope will make a major impact on the high levels of crime in some of Chicago's most dangerous neighborhoods. We have two reports, beginning with Phil Rogers. Veteran cops will always tell you that when it comes to solving crimes, every second counts. So this is citywide. We're looking at open calls to 911. NBC5 Investigates was given an exclusive first look at the Chicago Police Department's new Crime Prevention Information Center, a high-tech control room deep inside police headquarters, which serves as a conduit to put intelligence information into the hands of officers on the street. You used to have to wait maybe a couple hours for this information to come about. Now they can get it immediately. It's all here in real time, from snapshots of every crime in progress to the exact location of every police asset in the city. What are we seeing up here? So they, these are real-time uh, surveillance video uh, images. Officers in the CPIC can take control of any of more than 25,000 cameras deployed citywide. If the cameras recognize an offender, his mugshots can pop up here. And when a shooting occurs, instant intelligence information is available to show a victim's criminal history, places he has committed crimes, even friends who might retaliate. And this helps us get ahead of the crimes of where they're going to happen and where we should deploy our people. It's all designed to put information in the hands of police where they need it and when they need it. 
we can actually uh, deploy our people and help with investigations and help with the, with the officers in the street with this technology. And the idea is to be doing this as it happens? As it's happening, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is Marion Brooks. Any evidence from any crime scene in Chicago is brought here to the Chicago Police Department's evidence lab. We're giving victims closure. We're giving families closure. Let's start with ballistics. Any gun from a crime scene meticulously scrutinized. Technicians fire guns into water and a gun room and want the casings. That's where the gun identification happens. The best marked casings go here into the Integrated Ballistics Identification System, or IBIS, brand new to the CPD. And now we're basically going to put the cartridge into the cartridge case holder. The simple task of being able to load this casing themselves is a really big deal. They used to have to send casings to the state police, who had the only IBIS system, and it would then join the casings from departments all around the state, waiting for matches from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives. We wouldn't get results back for months sometimes. And now CPD sends the info to ATF themselves. This basically can be done within five hours from start to finish. Police believe the IBIS system alone is a game changer. What good is information a year later? You know, you need that information when you have a, a person of interest that you're talking to. And there's more. The things you see on those forensic crime shows happen here every day. But they're using actual equipment we use in our laboratory. IDing fingerprints. It's a process. First, the technicians look for prints with a naked eye. Then they get a superglue treatment. Superglue gently heats up, and when it gets to a boiling point, it off gases and creates a white, semi permanent plastic residue. The evidence is then dusted, stained, and then ready to come here. The final step so the technicians can best see these prints, you need a special light and a special filter, like on these glasses and on our lens. The prints become more pronounced. Without the filter, not so much. When photographed, they become even clearer. It's so much easier for the examiner now to work with it. And then there's the Leica station, L-E-I-C-A, a brand name. It's basically a mapping system that allows evidence text to duplicate a crime scene virtually, creating 3D and photographic blueprints of the scene. Instead of taking one measurement at a time, it takes millions of measurements at one time. They can even import the crime scene photos and map them on the scene. The magazine was found here and marked the crime scene marker number 14. Now it's an all digital presentation captivating, keeping the attention of the jury, very powerful evidence. And these texts do go to court, explaining their work as part of the job, a job they seem to love. It's very exciting, very rewarding. This is crime fighting from the lab. Even with these new resources, Chicago still has some serious problems in fighting crime inside these front lines. And that's where NBC5 Investigate steps in. We'll show you when we come back. Welcome back to our examination of the epidemic of violence inside Chicago's front lines. Over the past year, NBC5 Investigates has uncovered some serious problems in these crime-ridden neighborhoods. And we've gotten results from changing the way criminals are monitored across the entire city to shining a light on the problems of a single block. Here's Chris Coffey with the first of two of our investigations. That little bit of light you see are people's homes. Imagine walking alone on a block like this where it's hard to see even a few feet in front of you. That's what prompted some Southside residents to reach out to NBC5 Investigates, hoping we could shed some light on the dangers of the dark. When the lights go off, the shooting starts, and then the next thing you know, some, here's the police. Ramona Burwell lives in Englewood. The crime rate here is one of the highest in Chicago. She says a big problem is people who disable the lights. It's frayed wiring in there and they just reach up in it and pull it down. So because, there was a metal plate here yes, a week ago? Yes, mm -hmm, a week ago. CDOT says it makes repairs yeah, as quickly as possible, but Burwell says the lights were out when tragedy struck her block last year. Four men were shot inside a car at 73rd and Laughlin. Two of the men were killed. In fact, CDOT commissioned a study that proves what many fear. When streetlights go out, crime goes up. The most prevalent included theft, narcotics, 
battery, criminal damage. Northwestern PhD student Zach Seaskin helped crunch the study's numbers. Where you have multiple street lights affected down a block. If you look in the block where that kind of outage occurs, on average you see a 7% increase in the crimes we were looking at. The lights are out again. Residents here in Bronzeville say they want to prevent those crimes, but this video shows what neighbors on South King Drive have complained about for months. We can't just assume our lights are going to be on anymore. NBC5 investigates examined 311 service records and discovered that residents here notified the city about their block street light outages at least 12 times in one six month period. We complain all the time. We've complained repeatedly. Sometimes the lights are off three consecutive nights. CDOT tells us it makes repairs here but says the area is prone to frequent power outages. It makes you wonder why here? ComEd says power outages are actually down in the entire ward. We stopped by on a good night, the street lights were on. But neighbors say danger may be lurking in the shadows. And the CDOT study shows it takes on average about five days to make street light repairs. The city says it will now make repairing full blocks of non-working lights a priority. This is Phil Rogers. It all started with an exceptionally brutal attack. A 24-year-old student from Chicago State University, four months pregnant, carjacked this fall at Knife Point, then assaulted here in the 9800 block of South Indiana. Sexually assaulted her, then forced her in a trunk. It was the news of the day, and for many stories about Chicago violence, that's where it would end. But NBC5 investigates decided to take a closer look at the suspect arrested for this assault. And what we found ended up changing the entire system of how violent offenders are monitored in the Cook County Juvenile Courts. In the case of the CSU assault, police immediately arrested 17-year-old Aaron Parks, who at the time was awaiting sentencing on an armed robbery conviction. He'd also recently been charged as a juvenile in a previous carjacking of this woman, Gwendolyn Davis, who told us she was only able to escape by ramming a police squad car near 73rd and Ada. I tried to give him my keys, my phone, everything. He didn't want nothing. He wanted me. Following that attack, Parks was supposed to be confined to his home on electronic monitoring while he awaited trial, raising questions about how he could have left home undetected to allegedly commit such a violent assault. I would like to know how did this get so far where you don't know where someone is that has electronic ban on their leg. NBC5 investigates pulled Park's court records, which indicated he was allowed a few exceptions for school, medical attention, or religious services. On the day of the attack, which Park still says he did not commit, his mother, who asked that we not show her face, told us she thought he was here mile and a half from his home registering for classes at Olive Harvey College. In fact, police say he was a mile in the opposite direction, abducting and assaulting the young victim. When he leaves, they should pick that up because he's no longer in my home and that's where his monitor he's supposed to be at. And it didn't, it didn't happen. When we started asking questions, the probation officer assigned to monitor Parks was suspended and Parks was put in jail to await trial on both assaults. But then we learned something else that cast this story in a very different light. The electronic monitoring in juvenile probation is not a 24-hour monitoring system. You heard right. NBC5 investigates learned that the protocols in the Cook County system called for officers to only make periodic checks with long periods on nights and weekends when the monitoring center was not staffed at all, meaning for long periods every day, it's possible that no one is checking on these kids. So NBC5 investigates continue to ask more questions. And just five days after the attack, Cook County's juvenile probation chief, Rose Golden, told us she was scrapping the existing program and putting the county's electronic monitoring vendor, Sentinel Offender Services, in charge of full-time monitoring in an effort to stop any future walkaways like police say occurred in the Aaron Parks case. Union members say that's not enough that they should be given arrest powers to immediately bring in juveniles who have violated their electronic boundaries. And some in the community argue that tighter controls should be imposed on exactly who is allowed back on the street. You have juveniles here committing violent crimes that should have never been out. For the violent offenders who are out on the streets, there are former offenders, peacemakers, who are now trying to set them straight. We'll show you how they're making a difference when we come back.
The front lines that define Chicago's most violent neighborhoods are gang lines. Dangerous boundaries that can flare up instantly, even in these winter months. But some former gang members are making a difference, seeing this as the best time to try to break through those lines. Here again is Miriam Brooks. We may not see the same level of crime in the winter, but... Majority of the stuff that happened in the summertime start brewing during the winter times. That's why these former gang members don't stop working to fight gang violence when it's cold. They are two of the four peacemakers who focus on the South Side Auburn Gresham neighborhood. This is their time for them to really try to plan and strategize and their minds get to wonder what can we do once it get warm. So the peacemakers keep listening, heading into their homes. Going to their basements, talking to them, letting them know, you know, seeing what's really going on. What's happening on Facebook? What did he say? What happened at the high school? That's when to find out. The real beat. Who don't like who? Who might start shooting at who? That's key because according to police, the focal point of violence in the city is gangs. What's driving the violence today, yesterday, tomorrow, it's going to be the gangs. Deputy Chief Leo Schmitz commands the 7th District, Englewood. And according to the police, the gangs are concentrated mostly on the south and west sides. Even though crime is down, even though all the shootings and murders are down, those are still the ones that lead the pack. Why is this gang violence happening? St. Sabina's father, Michael Flager. The people shooting today are punks. They're coward punks. They're not men enough to come say, yeah, it's you that I'm after. I told you, you did this to me. I'm coming back for you. Now it's, I stand across the street or I do a drive-by and I shoot a spray of bullets. And then there are the factions. Deputy Chief Schmitz shows us a map of gang territories in his Englewood community. There's good people all over here. Even so, most of it is gang territory. The blue, the stripes, the dots, all different gangs and within those gangs, factions. These guys emotional killers, so they react off emotion. His baby mama got slapped. His sister got punched. He gonna react off that. They not even gang banging for no money or none of that. They just say everybody want to be this term a hitter. The police insist they have strategies. And last year in each one of these south and west side districts, crime was down or flat. And the peacemakers feel they're part of the solution, but they're not satisfied. It may be down, but it's not over. We want to put an end to crime here in Chicago. And we end our special report from inside the front lines with a pitch. Our team at NBC5 Investigates is committed to doing the stories that affect you directly. But we need to hear about those issues from you. What affects your neighborhood, your block, your family? We can't do these stories or get these results without you. So if you haven't already, please download our app or go to NBC5Chicago.com and click on the investigations page and send us the stories that matter most to you. Thanks for watching. NBC5 Investigates is a state-funded group home out of control. That's what neighbors and staff in Bronzeville neighborhoods say. NBC5's Tammy Leitner reports. The pop of gunfire can be heard nightly in this Bronzeville neighborhood. Last month, just before midnight, three kids were shot while talking in front of Aunt Martha's group home, a place meant to keep kids safe. They were right in this crosswalk right here. NBC5 Investigates has learned that all three kids were wards of the state and were living at this state-funded emergency shelter. One of the victims, an 11-year-old girl, had just run outside. They can come and go as they please. The kids are not supposed to leave Aunt Martha's, but neighbors say many of the young residents come and go all hours of the night. Having kids who have literally no supervision whatsoever, have the access to come out of a state-run facility is an abomination. State Representative Ken Duncan lives next door to the facility, which temporarily houses newborns through 20-year-olds, boys and girls. What time is it right now? Midnight. Duncan recently shot this video. It's midnight mm -hmm. on July 4th. Mm -hmm. And you're hanging out in front of... Aunt Martha's. Aunt Martha's. On Aunt Martha's. It's time for you all to go in. Why? We just got out you're here. You're 13. So? Wait, wait. Miguel, he's, uh, he's from the Here's the problem. You can't lock these kids in. That's only allowed at psychiatric facilities and detention centers. This is a short-term shelter. 
which means the kids are not supposed to leave. But state law says if a child demands to leave and is not a danger to anyone, no one can stop him. And in fact, NBC5 Investigates has found police have been called here for runaways 27 times in the last 12 months. But current and former employees we spoke to say there's a bigger problem inside. This was shot inside the facility. Raul Garza heads at Martha's Youth and Service Center. Is this behavior acceptable from a resident? It's not acceptable, but it's understood. And in these photos, former employees say a resident gained access to confidential client files that were supposed to be locked. We're told the resident read them and destroyed the documents. I'm not aware of it, no. They punched staff throw things at staff. Aurelia Daniel says she was attacked by residents four times during the year she worked at the home. Multiple other former employees tell us they were also assaulted. Has it become a dangerous situation there? Yes, very much so. So they're going to react and they're going to act out and sometimes engage in physical aggression to express how they're feeling about being there. They're frustrated. These kids may be frustrated and they may have had a hard road. But these kids are wards of the state. Isn't it your job to keep them safe? That's what we do. We succeed in doing that to a great extent. Despite the bad behavior and the shooting, both residents and employees say they don't want the shelter to shut down. They simply want things to change. No kids are unsalvageable. These children all could be helped. They all could be reached. All three kids survived the shooting. Since then, Aunt Martha says it has hired more staff and increased security. The CEO tells us Aunt Martha's is working with the community to resolve their concerns. Tammy Leitner, NBC5 Investigates. Our thanks to Tammy. The Cook County Sheriff's Office is taking extreme measures to suppress gun violence in Chicago. A new temporary detail deploys deputies from the city to the suburbs. And NBC5 investigates Tammy Leitner got an inside look as deputies went after those with arrest warrants for violent crimes. It's 25. Yeah. Deputies right. moving quickly surrounding the house. All right, we got Pat in the back. Oh, Jimmy, stand by. They got him in the back. It takes just minutes to find Maurice Jones hiding in the basement of his mother's home. Turn around, face me. The 42-year-old can now stop looking over his shoulder. Did you know sheriff's deputies were looking for you? Uh, they came by here once before. He has a warrant for DUI, and like many others, he's a repeat offender. I wasn't ready to go to jail right now. That's the truth. Wasn't ready to go to jail. Most of them aren't. The other people that we're looking for. Which is why sheriff's deputies are targeting fugitives with outstanding warrants, going neighborhood to neighborhood as part of a six-week special detail to help Chicago police combat gun violence in the city. All right. 120 deputies flood this south side neighborhood, and we see firsthand just how hard it is to find these people with warrants. Can you open the door, please? Deputies check address after address. Hello, it's the sheriff's department. Following leads like a trail of breadcrumbs. Do you mind if we show you a picture, see if you recognize the person? This address was a dead end, but this is by no means the end of the search for this guy. Sometimes it's hard to get a good address, and once we get one, we work it pretty good. As for Jones, his outstanding warrant is for a misdemeanor, but most warrants in these concentrated sweeps target violent criminals, allowing Chicago police to focus their efforts on reducing the city's gun violence. Tammy Leitner, NBC5 News. In the ride along, Tammy took part in. Sheriff's deputies made 33 arrests and confiscated 11 guns. NBC5 investigates inside the front lines. We go inside a crime-ridden West Side neighborhood with an ex-gang member who used to be part of the problem, but now he hopes to be part of the solution. Here's Tammy Leitner. This is Cicero and Van Bruen. This is where me and eight other guys started a street gang called the Cicero Undertaker Vice Lords. Most people in this Austin neighborhood know Clifton McFowler simply as Booney. I never went anywhere without a gun and a bulletproof vest. Armed robberies, drugs, and eventually murder. It was all part of gang life, and it cost him 37 years behind bars. We had no idea that 40 years later, the effects of something that we did as kids will have on my community. This once vibrant community is now plagued by abandoned businesses, boarded up homes, 
drugs, unemployment, and street gangs. Ah, uh, you finally made one. Booney now spends his days keeping kids like JV Owen Reed away from gangs. I talk to Booney a lot. The 16-year-old met Booney after he was arrested for having a gun. Why do people get into gangs in this neighborhood? Uh, it's just a life that he was raised by. JV Owen served several months of house arrest and now spends his days with Booney here at Build, a program for at-risk kids in troubled West Side neighborhoods. What's your grade point at? The program gives kids in this area a fighting chance and this former gang member a purpose. And I believe that's my punishment, is to come back to my community and to save as many as I can. And that's a good punishment. I can live with that. A staggering number of ex-cons return to Austin when released from prison. That's a tough um, burden on a community. State Representative LaShawn Ford has lobbied for resources to resuscitate the ailing area. Austin is a rich community that lots of people come from that has abandoned the community because of the lack of services. For Booney, abandoning his roots is not an option. I did my time. The time was just a part of it. The big part of it is now coming back to these places where I was part of the problem for so long and being part of that solution. And that means even after his day is over at Build, Booney hits the streets of Austin, counseling kids right there on the street corners. Tammy Leitner, NBC5 Investigates. Really making a difference. Thanks, Tammy.